I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode 73 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 073. Now, I do apologize. It looks like the background music was a little bit muted there. I am adjusting controls. I kind of... I kind of had somebody over that had a kid with them and a lot of my controls on my mixer got adjusted. And being the hard copy type of person I am, I kept a hard copy and not a digital copy. And my notes are now orange juice uh, colored. So I don't really know what they used to be. I went by memory, so I apologize if everything sounds a little weird, but that's all there is. I, that's all I can do. Hey, I... I have been a very busy person the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, as of today, Monday, when I'm recording this episode, I made a trip to Amarillo, took care of some business I had there. I figured, you know what? I got a friend that's, that lives here. I want to drop in and see him. You know, this friend, uh, this friend uh, you can find this friend of mine if you're in Amarillo by going to Long Hunters over there on 6th Street and checking out the gun store there. They kind of cater to the cowboy action shooting crowd and just go in there and check them out. And I'm not going to name who there is my friend, but, you know, it's good to have friends in the industry and in disciplines that it, that you really do not mess with that much. But, hey, you know, I had fun. I spoke to a friend I hadn't seen in a while. And on my way out of Amarillo, heading back towards home, I saw a gentleman in a car. I had never seen one quite with that configuration. It looked like a restoration, and I don't mean a resto mod that's so popular nowadays, but I'm talking about a restoration. So I pulled in where he was pulling in. I talked to him a little bit, and we we went into a gun store that he was going to check out. I went in. I was about to leave when I saw something that I hadn't seen when I'd walked the entire store already, and I asked to see it. No, the price on it was too good to pass up, and I ended up buying a third series Colt Woodsman match target with a four and a half inch barrel. Now, this is one of the later production guns. In fact, I'm going to say, based on the serial number, it was produced in 77. It is a 22 long rifle, it's a 10 plus one capacity. It is definitely a single action. The sights on it, well, it's a fixed front sight with an adjustable rear, rear sight, it's an all steel gun. And because this thing's out of production, there is no MSRP. I kind of did this in a show, gun of the show format, although it's not going to be a gun of the show. The finish on this thing is exquisite. It's that old school Colt bluing, but it's undamaged. It's beautiful. And because of the condition this gun is in, I want to say it has been fired very little to none. That is how clean this gun is. Anyways, I am still doing research on it. I'm trying to determine... If this gun's been fired outside of the factory test firing, I don't know for sure. There was no boxer papers with it, but I have seen guns in this condition without boxes and papers before. They were part of an estate sale where the gun was sold and the box and papers got lost in the cleanup. Gentlemen, I'm going to ask you, ladies that own guns, you too, talk to your significant others so that they know if you pass away, Take your guns to a reputable place to have them appraised, and then when they sell them, include make sure make sure they know where to find things like cases and boxes, the paperwork, all of it. Because when you move on, you can't take this with you. But when they go to clear out what you have that they don't want to keep, you will help them by helping them know, hey, take this here, get it appraised and then sell it elsewhere. Make sure they understand. Don't sell it where you have it appraised. Get it appraised. Make sure you have it appraised with the box and the paperwork, or make sure they know to have it appraised with the box and the paperwork. And then maybe grandchildren or great-grandchildren or even children will have a college fund that they did not anticipate, or maybe they'll have a larger college fund that they did not anticipate. Who knows? But hey, Enough about talking about guns, estate sales, and things like that. I have actually dropped in on a couple of those, and I'm not, well, it wasn't willingly. I did check out a few. They, I actually spoke to the people selling it, selling some guns at an estate sale. I told them, hey, 
I understand you want to move this and get it out of here, but you're asking way too little. Actually put them in touch with somebody that does appraisals. And I don't know what the end result was, but I'm hoping they were going to get more money than the 50 and $100 price tags they had on the guns. I couldn't have bought them in good conscience. But like I said, I didn't go to these estate sales willingly. I went to them because somebody I was with wanted to go to these estate sales. But enough about that. I need to move on. I need to let you know how to get the show. Then we're going to come back. And I want to cover what a lot of listeners have been sending me over the last two weeks. Actually, I want to cut a lot of that out. Uh, we're going to limit it to stuff I've got in the last few days. So with that said, here's how to get the show. And when we come back, we're going to talk about, well, listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. I have gotten a lot of feedback from listeners. Uh, there's actually been a rash of Facebook likes on the Gun Rights in Texas podcast page. I don't know what's going on there. And by a rash of them, it could be the same notifications coming up over and over again because, well, I've been too busy to deal with social media. But I have had listeners sending me a lot of feedback. I've had listeners sending me a lot of information coming from various sources. And a lot of listeners are feeding me the same thing. So I'm leaning towards these things being factual, even though they're coming from closed social media groups. I'm not really going to touch on... I'm not going to touch on the stuff going on with... uh with any of the smaller groups. I'm going to actually touch on the things going on with Open Carry Texas. Listeners have been feeding me a lot of details from OCT's closed groups. And to acknowledge them, I'm going to update the listeners that haven't received this information from, or that are not in these closed groups. I'm going to update those people with the information that I've been given. But I'm only going to cover three items that I'm being fed right now. And, well... The first two kind of dovetail together along with the recent activities of an OCT group of men that showed up on the Texas CHO forum, or showed up again. You see, recently, the Houston OCT admin, this would be Valentin Gonzalez, I believe. I hope I didn't mispronounce his name. But anyways, he paid a visit back to the Texas CHO forum in what appears to be an attempt to stir things up a bit. I and others confronted him about open carry Texas's social media behavior being similar to that of anti-gunners. After a bit of prodding, Gonzalez openly admitted that OCT bans people with dissenting views. Way to go. A lot of reason discourse over there on the OCT page. Yep. But what really may, but this is what really makes the first item coming out of the closed OCT groups interesting. You see, that first item is that OCT leadership and probably some of the members are complaining about being banned from the Texas Sheriff's Deputy's Facebook page because they do not agree with the admins of that page. And apparently C.J. Grisham is among those. And at some point he issued a statement. I don't know if it was to Open Carry Texas to their official Facebook page or one of their closed groups or multiple closed groups because the people telling me this aren't telling me which group they're getting it from or anything like that. Typically, I have to ask them, okay, which group are you pulling this information from? But anyways, to kind of segue that into the next one, his statement regarding OCT membership or members or leadership being banned from the Texas Sheriff's Deputy's Facebook page is signed with him stating he is president of Open Carry Texas. And like I said, that kind of segues into our second topic. You see, a while back, and this is a couple of months ago, I believe, Open Carry Texas issued a press release stating that Grisham was stepping down from his role of being Open Carry Texas or the president of Open Carry Texas. Now, he was doing this so he could eh, could concentrate on his political campaign for Senate District 24, and Senate District 24 is for a state Senate seat. But he is still signing his statements that he is president of Open Carry Texas, which makes one wonder, was the press release false? Was it incorrect? Was it just a straight-up lie? Or what? What's going on here? Is Open Carry Texas back to the lying, cheating, 
sneaky revisionist history behavior that they are kind of famous for. I don't know, but something's not kosher. And we kind of touched on it, but, or I could have segued into it a little better, but you know what? Who cares? Because the third open carry Texas issue I want to touch on is Grisham and his Senate District 24 campaign seat or campaign. It seems that quite well, apparently he announced that if he does not raise some money tonight, and I'm recording this on Monday the 19th, I'm not entirely sure what the, yes, October 19th. I'm recording this on October 19th. And, well, apparently Grisham has a meet and greet and clean. And he said if he doesn't raise some funds there, he's actually going to suspend his campaign. Now, as of his posting earlier today, Grisham has raised a total of $185 out of a $10,000 goal on some political website that does donations. Now, it's quite telling that OCT cannot even get their president enough money to run in a primary, which in essence shows how little political capital Open Carry Texas actually has. These are the same people claiming that they passed Open Carry when they tried to kill it. These are the same people that threatened to primary a candidate against everybody who stood in the way of Open Carry. Now, that threat was made, when was it, uh, before the election? Or before the session started, they said they were going to primary somebody against everyone who stood in the way of open carry. And by open carry, they were referring to their uh, view, which would be unlicensed carry. Which, don't get me wrong, that's the end goal. The end goal is to have unlicensed carry strike every gun control law we can from the books. And then keep anybody from making progress on re-implementing this. The truth of the matter is, we're not going to do that overnight. But it's quite telling that, you know, DJ is talking about suspending his campaign because he hasn't raised enough money. And Open Carry Texas is supposedly this huge powerhouse in political circles. If they really were such a powerhouse, they could guarantee Grisham's election if they were as powerful as OCT likes to say they are. But once again, reality and facts do not mix well with anti-gunners or Open Carry Texas. On that note, I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get to, how to find the show on social media, which I really should do, but more work with. And then after that, we're going to come back and we're going to hit our topic. And if I was the kind of person that was that was criminal in any way, I would be either playing an audio clip of a song or quoting the lyrics of a song. But I respect copyright law, and I'm just going to say. The topic of this episode is signs, signs, and more signs. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, as I said, the ooh, I'm over here adjusting the mixer, and you might have heard my voice spike there. I'm hoping I can fix that in post-production. As I said, the topic of this episode is signs, signs, and more signs. And essentially, this episode is going to discuss the signage that we are going to see that prohibits lawful carry in any form that will be in effect as of January 1st, 2016. First off, we're going to look at the generic signs used everywhere and what they mean. Then we'll look at the signage required to prohibit legal concealed carry. And finally, we're going to look at what is required to prohibit open carry. I'm not trying to help somebody actually find a way to ban carry. I'm trying to make sure that the listeners of this show know this is what this sign means and this is how you know if this sign is legitimate. And the first sign we're going to touch on operates off of Texas Penal Code Section 30.05, which is the criminal trespass statute. Now, a person can be charged with criminal trespass when they enter or remain on a property of another without effective consent, and they, when they have been given notice that entry is forbidden or received notice to depart and fail to do so. Notice can be tied to conditions such as no firearms permitted, no smoking, shoes required, and things like that. Now, 
Notice under section 30.05 can take the form of a sign, oral notice, printed on a paper such as a flyer, etc., skywriting, and any other way you can think of to deliver the message. Signs can be the classic gunbuster sign. It can be simply the words, no guns allowed, and so on. Now, what the sign actually does is it prevents long gun carry. It can probably prevent pre-1899 and black powder replica carry. And technically, it makes it illegal to illegally carry, or it makes it illegal or more illegal to illegally carry a handgun onto the property. That doesn't make sense. But that's what they want to do. Can you be arrested? Well, you see, under Texas Penal Code Section 30.05F, you have a defense to prosecution if you're licensed to carry a handgun. And if the if the uh, notice applies or the prohibition on entry is based on carrying a handgun. So basically, if you're charged under Section 30.05, you have a defense to prosecution. And as such, yeah, you can be arrested, but you're going to get off. As a result, most officers understand the law. They're not going to arrest you for carrying past an invalid sign because why do they want to waste their time, waste your time, and face and face consequences as a result of wasting your time, their time, and their supervisor's time, the district attorney's time, or the county attorney's time, whichever attorney ends up handling the charges. Now, most of the time, they're not going to bother. But like I said, this notice will probably apply to pre-1899 and black powder replicas and apply to long guns. Now, you may make an argument that says, well, they had a sign that banned handguns and I was carrying a long gun. Or maybe they had a sign that carried Beretta 92s and I was carrying a Glock 19. Odds are the judge and or jury are going to laugh at you and deliver a guilty verdict. The next section we're going to touch on is Texas Penal Code Section 30.06. 30.06 has been, or 30.06, has been a kind of a love-hate item among the Texas concealed handgun license holders. Some see it as a means of keeping them from carrying. Others see it as protection for being able to carry. Then why do people see it differently? Well, there are those who feel that because they're carrying concealed and they're licensed and they've gone through a background check quite similar to that police officers often go through, that maybe they should be treated like police officers and be able to carry. And they feel that Section 30.6 is a impediment. Impediment? Blah, I'm getting tongue-tied. You know what I'm trying to say. It's an impediment to carrying anywhere. Now, others are seeing it as, well, the legislature is going to provide property owners a tool to keep people carrying guns off their property if they don't want them on it. And we'd rather have a very well-structured and very well-thought-out notice requirement rather than a sticker that can be one millimeter by one millimeter stuck at foot level that's light gray on a white background. Now, the law in regards to Texas Penal Code Section 30.6 lays out some very specific language that applies only to people carrying a concealed handgun with a license. As of January 1st, 2015, not September, or not 2015, 2016, let me get my date right here. As of January 1st of 2016, a violation of this section of the penal code will most often be a Class C misdemeanor. Locations posted under the campus carry law will be a Class A misdemeanor, and it will be a Class A misdemeanor if someone receives oral notice and fails to leave. Can you be arrested? Yeah. In fact, you can pretty much expect to be arrested even if you are found to be carrying past a sign that does not meet the legal requirements. And the reason for that is the officer is going to say, well, you received effective notice. And the district attorney may agree with them. The county attorney may agree with them. And it should be a county attorney that's dealing with it because it's a misdemeanor. But I have seen cases where the district attorney prosecutes misdemeanors because, well, politics. Now, many law enforcement officers may not even realize the sign does not apply if you don't meet certain requirements. And some may not care. So, yes, you can be arrested and you, can, you will probably be arrested if you're caught carrying past this sign. Now, keep in mind. Law enforcement officers may not realize this sign does not apply to open carry, 
although they should because they should have that covered in their continuing law enforcement uh, training. And they may not realize it doesn't apply to long gun carry as well as pre-1899 and black powder replicas. In essence, you may carry past a sign that does not meet the language requirements or it does not meet the exact verbiage requirement or it may not even meet the size requirements. But you can still be arrested because they're going to say, well, it was close enough. Will it be an illegal, will it be an illegal arrest? I don't know. I'm not an attorney. I just know that you probably will be arrested. Now, I do have a philosophy on 30-06 signs, and that philosophy will continue to 30-07 later, and I'll touch on 30-07 in a moment. This philosophy is these people do not want you carrying in their business, and they do not want you carrying in their business, but but they don't care enough to go research exactly what the law says. So if you have options, go somewhere else. If you don't have an option, then it's up to you to decide if you're going to carry past an invalid sign or not. And there are people that say, well, concealed means concealed. If you're doing it right, nobody's going to know. Am I in that camp? I'm not going to say. I have a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate myself. And no matter how I answer it, I'll incriminate myself with one group or another. This is a personal decision that you have to make for yourself. Now, we're going to move on to the next section of the law that will prohibit legal carry. And this one is a bit more of a, well, in a way it's a celebratory item. And in a way, it's, uh, well, why do we need two signs? And that'd be section 30.07. We never thought the legislature would pass a bill that had a two-sign requirement to ban licensed legal carry. It surprised the heck out of a lot of people when it happened. And I don't have a problem with it. It was good to, it was good to have it passed. Businesses are going to say, well, why do we need two signs? Others will say, well, why do we need a sign at all? And others say, well, why do you need to ban me from carrying? Two signs seem like a pretty good compromise. Now, as of January 1st, 2016, Texas Penal Code Section 30.07 will lay out some very specific language that applies only to people carrying a handgun openly. And you may be wondering, why would somebody openly carrying a handgun need a sign to keep them out? Surely they'll just come up and give them verbal notice. And they can do that. But keep in mind, Like the 30-06 sign, the 30-07 sign, and I should have touched on this in 30-06, but it'll work to cover it here. These only apply to license holders. A police officer's exempt from signage. Get over it. Criminals don't have a license. 30-06 and 30-07 don't apply to them. So you might say criminals are exempt from it too. Now, a violation of Texas Penal Code Section 30.07 will, in most cases, be a Class A misdemeanor. But if someone receives oral notice and fails to leave, it's a class, or it'll be a class C, and then it's a class A if they receive notice and fail to leave. Sorry about that. But yeah, most often it'll be a class C misdemeanor, unless you get oral notice and fail to leave. I'm tired. I'm looking at my outline, and I'm not reading it correctly. It's been a long two weeks. Can you be arrested? It's even more likely with open carry than concealed carry. This is in part because if you're found to be carrying past a sign that does not meet legal requirements, It's kind of obvious, and you can expect to be arrested. Now, keep in mind that many officers will not exactly know the requirements for legal notice. They'll have a general idea of what the signage should look like, and they'll have a very general idea of what the language should be that's on the sign. Now, they'll probably know it a lot better, say, January 1st, than they will October 15th, and this is because of their continuing law enforcement education. Now, the interesting thing is that if someone is carrying a long gun openly or a pre-1899 handgun or a black powder replica of a pre-1899 handgun, this sign doesn't apply to them if they don't have a license. If they're carrying a long gun, it does not apply to them at all. If If they're openly carrying a handgun, it applies if they have a license. If they don't have a license, well, and some folks may say, well, It's not defined as a firearm, so, well, yeah, but you're going to have a hard time convincing a jury that your pre-1899 or black powder replica that you're openly carrying past a legally valid .30-07 isn't a handgun under the licensing law. It becomes convoluted. You'll probably end up setting some case law, positive or negative. I don't know. But you know what? 
when a business posts a 30-06 or a 30-07 sign, they're telling you, we wish to protect our customer from criminals with guns, or at least that's what they think they're saying. But in reality, these signs by their nature only apply to people who are licensed to legally carry a handgun. And this just happens to be the most law-abiding group of people tracked by the Texas DPS. For the record, and I just want to make sure this is on the record, the people these signs apply to are actually several times more law-abiding than Texas law enforcement officers. And with that said, these signs are essentially telling the most law-abiding segment of the population in Texas that they are not welcome in this business because they are law-abiding citizens. And that's what, it, that's what they're saying. Now, why would a business tell the most law-abiding segment of the population they are not welcome? Maybe it's because they are concerned that these law-abiding citizens might injure a more criminal segment of the population. Maybe it's because they're projecting their own prejudices and flaws onto the, these law-abiding people, and they know they would not be so law-abiding themselves. But who knows? Maybe they just want to make sure that a criminal can come in, rape, murder, rob, pillage at will, and leave without being interfered with. But whatever their reason, who knows why they wish to discriminate against people for being a part of the most, mo most law-abiding segment of the population. The truth is, they choose to do so, and that's their right, no matter how immoral the act or their motivations are. And that's really how I look at a 30-06 or a 30-07 sign. These signs are basically saying, we don't want you in my, or the, they're saying, we don't want you in our business because you are too law-abiding. Does that make sense? Not from a logic point of view. It doesn't make sense that they would say that, but that's what they're saying. And I hate it. I really, really hate it. But you know what? I've drugged this on long enough. Let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. And then we'll come back and hit the news. I've got my traditional three articles, and then we'll wrap up the show. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409 292-6736. Okay, we're here for the Gun Rights in Texas news segment, and we're going to do our traditional three articles, and then we're going to wrap up the show. Now, our first story, I'm putting it in the zero tolerance category. A school went into lockdown in Kyle, Texas, when a student asked for gum. Now, the story behind this is that another student heard the request and did not hear it correctly. The other student reported to the school staff that he thought the student had asked for a gun. Gun. Gum. Very similar sounding, I'll admit. Very similar spelling, I will admit. Now, the school did go into lockdown while the incident was investigated. Later, the lockdown was lifted and the school sent a letter to the parents explaining what happened. Moving on to the politics category, three private colleges in Texas have stated their intention to ban handguns completely once the campus carry bill goes into effect. The University of North Texas reports that someone suggested they could ban carry where alcohol is served and then begin serving alcohol in all buildings. That was kind of shot down because one of the people associated with that university said, well, we're not going to really need that drastic of a measure. Now, Chancellor Duncan of Texas Tech, which I had to drive through when I went to Amarillo and came back from Amarillo, but anyway, or not Texas Tech, but of, Lubbock, of Texas Tech in Lubbock, but anyways, Chancellor Duncan of Texas Tech, located in Lubbock, Texas, has stated that he intends to push for increased training for people wanting to carry on the Texas Tech campus. He does admit the university cannot require it, but he hopes students will be willing to get the additional training. Hell, if they offer the class for free, I would be willing to take the additional training. If they offer it for a reduced price, I would be willing to take the additional training, simply because you can never have enough training. Now, if they offer it for you know, if they say, well, we're offering this class for campus carry, and it's going to be $9,999.99, well, that's not going to happen. If they say, well, it's $105, and you have to supply your own ammo, we'll go in, we'll, we'll do simunitions, and we'll do this, we'll do that. Yeah, I would pay, I would pay for that. 
Anything in between depends on what the class consists of, how much, and all that. Moving on, the Texas DPS has decided not to allow non-law enforcement or non-law enforcement officer employees to open carry while they are at work. This decision is one that is bound to cause some controversy, at least among open carry advocates, who will say employees should be allowed to open carry or conceal carry in whichever manner they wish, and gun control advocates who say who will say employees should be prohibited from carrying altogether. Now, this article comes to us from the Dallas Morning News, so if you go to the show notes and follow the link, do so and read it with a grain of salt. Hey, I'm I'm hoping I can get all the sneezing and snorting and nose blowing edited out, and I do apologize if I miss something. However, let me say, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. That's a wrap for this episode. I was thinking about throwing something here on the end, but, well, I really don't have anything to talk about. So I'm going to throw you on a little bit of a talk about why I went to Amarillo. You see, I went and I paid off my Jeep Wrangler. I still have my Jeep Wrangler. I like it a lot. And, well, I understand that it's kind of limited. If I decide to go to the range after work, well, I have to leave work, come home, and get my guns, get my gear, and then go to the range. And the reason I have to do that is the Jeep Wrangler is about as insecure of a vehicle with a soft top as you can imagine. If you want to break into a Jeep Wrangler with a soft top, odds are the person that owns it's not even going to lock the doors. Because if you got a knife, you can just cut your way in. Or if you don't have a knife and you have half a brain, all you got to do is peel back a flap on a window, unzip the window, and now you're in. The criminals seem to like cutting these tops, so we're... We're used to that. However, I did pick up another vehicle. I'm not going to discuss exactly what it is, but it gives me a little bit more security and a lot better gas mileage. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. And until next time, which will hopefully be in a week, not two weeks, 